Okay. So I'm really delighted to be at uh, this school, and uh, I really wanted to first to thank uh, Patrick for all the work he has done organizing this. Uh, I know Patrick is about to leave. Uh, he has to go back to Munich, uh, but I thought we should uh, uh, thank him for organizing uh, a wonderful school. So, yesterday, I'm sure a lot of people missed it, but there was a special event at uh, DLR celebrating uh, uh, sort of uh, the summer uh, fiesta. And at uh, that event, uh, Professor Herzinger demonstrated great abilities in uh, teleoperation of robots. And he, 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 he was really quite excited. I was, I was surprised by his skills. And uh, he, he, he managed to, uh, uh, to, together with Antonio, to, to, to win uh, several uh, games. Uh, well, there was a lot of music. Uh, Sammy was uh, playing uh, uh, guitar, and uh, a lot of uh, people at DLR uh, were just enjoying uh, this uh, beautiful uh, summer evening there. Now, uh, coming back from uh, Munich all the way, it was it was quite uh, interesting because there was no more boats, and I really didn't want to swim, so I I sort of. Uh, called uh, a, a taxi. Uh, this boat was uh, quite long. Was boat. And uh, here is the space inside of which I was uh, traveling come here late in the night. Um, so uh, I'm sure uh, t this afternoon we will have a, a, a beautiful excursion, except uh, I'm going to complain to Patrick about the weather because he organized the weather very nicely in the last few days, but uh, I'm not sure about the weather this afternoon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, robots are, I mean, we all know robots are coming and closer to the human. And uh, we are uh, really uh, going through a very exciting time for robotics because uh, this brings a lot of uh, challenges. But before starting, I wanted to go over a little bit of uh, history about what we have been doing in the field. Uh, there are uh, longer uh, videos uh, summarizing a lot of the uh, contributions. I'm going to show you a one that was uh, uh, edited in uh, the 80s. So let me, okay, just, where, what, uh, it's right here. With music. So this was the first implementation of potential field uh, to, for collision avoidance. Uh, this was the first uh, compliant motion force control with a Puma, the robot doesn't care about the surface. Oh, this is me, long time ago. Uh, compliance, uh, contact, uh, surface, simulations of contact, elastic planning, cooperative manipulation, three arm manipulation, Macro mini actuation and the uh, manipulation. Redundancy, singularity, mobile manipulation. And we started to move now in the 90s. Here is uh, some of the early work in uh, contact with a surface. This is uh, uh, torque control. The, uh, uh, the robot uh, artisan and we started to develop the platform uh, for exploring uh, mobile manipulation we will uh, see a little more about uh, mobile manipulation as we go uh, in the discussion but 
First, uh, let me show you the latest, the very, very latest uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, is still uh, in the news right now. And this is uh, uh, a small project my student uh, in class developed. It is uh, called uh, the Jedi robot. And uh, so this is uh, a robot interacting with a human uh, using a uh, Kinect. Uh, the uh, uh, we are localizing the human uh, position, and we are able to. Uh, to perform a, a very uh, smart uh, interaction in terms of uh, defensive and offensive uh, behaviors. Uh, in fact, uh, what uh, I wanted to show you here is that once we have the right proper uh, infrastructures for a robot, when we have the right platform, it becomes really easy to, to perform uh, advanced uh, behaviors of interaction that are quite uh, challenging if we start from scratch. And, or if we start with the wrong uh, uh, platform. So this was uh, quite interesting, and uh, currently uh, this is uh, uh, in the news at Stanford and uh, elsewhere. Some of you probably have seen uh, different videos, and uh, they, uh, the news is coming uh, to, to, to make more videos, and uh, the students are very excited about working in more behavior. This was done in three weeks. As we move uh, to the human environment, uh, in my view, the first and biggest challenge we are facing is safety. And uh, we, have, we have seen a number uh, of development uh, during this school are going on around the world in terms of building robots that are safe. Because without safety, we are not going to be able to really de deploy this robot in the human environment. Now, we are seeing also very complex uh, robotic system, humanoid robotic system. And what we see is mostly robots that are capable of walking. And uh, the question is, go beyond walking. Now, there are a lot of development to bring manipulation to, mobile, uh, to uh, humanoid robotic systems. But what, what we are doing is adding a, a controller over another controller, uh, trying to deal with constraints. And what we are ending up with are controllers that are fighting each other uh, while trying to perform a task. So there is a, a clear need for addressing the problem in its totality. That is, we need to think about a unified framework where we can integrate constraints together with uh, contact uh, control, together with the motion and, and the posture behaviors. A very important aspect of the interaction brings uh, uh, compliance, uh, force control, and contact. Now, what is interesting about those systems is it's not anymore uh, dealing with contact at one point. And the challenge is how can we produce contact at multiple points and create compliances at all these points in a uh, coherent and consistent way. So. You know, these robots are quite uh, limited in their uh, power. So they have about 15 minutes of, uh, of uh, autonomy. So imagine uh, these robots working in the environment. From time to time, they need to sit and uh, re regenerate, uh, re re reload their, their energy. And, uh, and uh, if you think about this task, this is quite challenging. How can you get this robot to sit? Uh, that is, how can you make compliance at multiple points uh, without fighting, without, uh, uh, while dealing with the interaction? So let me show you the results, and we will go back and, and look at uh, how this is being done. Uh, here we are introducing uh, a task where the human is going to teach the robot how to perform this task. This is Ashimo suddenly becoming compliant. Uh, Ashimo is a, for a position control robot, but we developed a technique to allow the robot to be compliant through a, a position to torque transformation. And then we applied the whole body controller uh, with all the, the contact and uh, uh, constraint control uh, uh, at, uh, integrated together with the posture. And all of that is allowing us to, to now uh, uh, move the robot and have the robot control to follow a human-guided motion. 
Well, this is very important when we start teaching the robot tasks as we, we need to uh, be able uh, to show the robot where to move and how uh, it can move. At the same time, we do not want to deal with all the degrees of freedom. So there are a large number of degrees of freedom that are uh, coordinated automatically through the posture control through criteria. However, the robot is following just the guidance of the human, uh, in, he, in this case, uh, just moving, following the hands. Now, this cannot be done unless we are able to perceive the environment. And, and the perception is going to be a, a huge uh, difficulty in integrating the different sensory information in a system that is going to have tactile uh, position and uh, many other sensors. But the question is not anymore to deal with the free space motion if we are going to interact with the environment. We need to deal also with the contact space. We need to deal with, with the tactile information. We need to to uh, recognize normals. We need to integrate of sensory information in a way that is so that we can uh, produce motions and then we can insert this robot in the environment. But as we touch the environment, we need not only to deal with the contact forces, but we need to de deal with the reaction forces and as well as the internal forces exerted on the robot. So the challenges brings, as I, I said, uh, sensing and perception uh, uh, issues that needs to be done in real time for an unstructured environment, planning, control, and skill development for a robot with many degrees of freedom uh, to, uh, in fact, to develop skills. We do not want to control those robots and program them for every task. We need to be able to interact with human in a, a easy, simple way. We need to deal with uh, also the the design of the sensors and mechanisms and build the, those uh, safe uh, structures that can really be deployed, not only safe, but capable. Performance is, is uh, basically the challenge when we are building for safety. So the theme uh, essentially is a theme, is one where we are talking about both interactivity and human-friendly uh, uh, robotic system in that they are safe and capable. Well, let's talk a little bit about safety. I think we, we had a lot of discussion about safety and I would, would like to, to, to go a little bit over uh, the development we have uh, been pursuing at Stanford in, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the past uh, uh, 10 years. So, as I said, safety is very important. Uh, however, what is challenging is combining safety together with performance because the two are always competing when we are designing those systems. So let's just consider this machine interacting with the human. We need to, to see uh, when human and human are interacting, uh, there is uh, also an issue of, of safety and uh, there are capabilities that are deployed by the human when a human are interacting together. So what is, what is really critical in the safety is those masses that are moving and how those masses reflected inertias at the contact location. So if, if we look at the human and if we look at uh, the normalized index of effective inertia for the human, it is a small number, it is uh, about 0.04. Now, if we go to a robot, uh, all of you know, uh, like uh, the, the Puma, uh, that ratio goes up many, many times higher. And uh, clearly, we have a problem. We have a problem because we are thinking about robots that actually were designed for uh, industrial applications without any interaction with the human. And now we are taking those same technologies uh, to develop uh, machines that could eventually interact with the human. So at Stanford, we built uh, something uh, called uh, a distributed uh, macro mini actuation, DM2, that uh, bring this number much closer to that of the human. And further on, we will see in the hybrid actuation we developed, this is coming closer and closer, even uh, lower than that of the human. The main problem, the main problem and difficulty is that when we are putting an actuator, either the actuator is heavy and large, direct drive, and then we end up with a large mass that is moving and propagate in the structure, or we are going to use gears. When we are using gears, what we forget is this reflected inertia coming from the rotor through the transmission system, the gear ratio. 
that is being amplified by the n square of the gear ratio. So a designer, when we are designing a robot, we go and say, all right, well, I need to carry this load. The last link will have to, to carry this load. So I dimension the motor there. And I come up with a, a, some motor that will carry the continuous torque needed to carry the load. What we forget is actually that this is uh, needed at low frequency. At higher frequency, that is, for the control itself, we really don't need that magnitude. But the designer is under the constraints of saying, in this same motor, I'm going to carry the load and I'm going to provide the performance. So the motor is going to be dimensioned with large magnitude of torque and at the same time going to deliver uh, the, the dynamics that is needed. If we do the analysis in the frequency domain, what we observe is that at lower, at higher frequencies, we, we need much lower uh, magnitude in the torque, which means the requirement in the torques at a given joint uh, are actually much lower, which ad would allow us to break the, the motors and go beyond thinking about one joint, one motor, to think about one joint, multiple motor, perhaps two. So this is the idea of the, the uh, distributed macro mini actuation where essentially we place a motor at the joint, we place a motor away, and uh, through a, a cable transmission we are able to bring the large uh, magnitude uh, to the joint without increasing the weight of the link. However, this is not going to work, obviously, because uh, this is going to reflect large inertia. But because the large motor is not needed at high frequency, we can decouple it and we create series elastic for uh, the high magnitude of torque. And we are going to be able to have a small, tiny motor at the joint to produce the required uh, dynamics and responsiveness. So this was uh, uh, developed in, into a system uh, that de 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 displayed uh, really remarkable properties in terms of uh, the performance, uh, high performance robot system. At the same time, this robot system uh, is acting like a very small, lightweight robot uh, because uh, what is rigid in it is all these small motors and light structure. The problem with this design was the, the complexity, the mechanical complexity in the design. And we started to move uh, towards uh, new ideas where instead of using uh, two motors, two electrical motors for uh, a system like this, we were uh, inspired by the idea of using pneumatic muscles. Now, pneumatic muscles are not going to provide the dynamic responses that we need. However, if we think about uh, the concept of DM2 and integrate with the pneumatic muscle another small motor, we will be able to display uh, both the performance and the safety. Now, the problem, if you think about controlling a large number of degrees of freedom with, with uh, pneumatic muscle, you have all kind of uh, uh, tubes coming to each of the muscles to control the pressure. And the reason is uh, the uh, pressure amplifier, the, the typical pressure amplifier, are quite large. So the only way we can address this problem is to find a way where we can have one line of pressure running through the system and distributed by reducing the size of pneumatic muscle, uh, pneumatic uh, amplifiers. And uh, once we ask the right question, then we can find the answer. It is, it is always uh, uh, amazing how uh, in our research, what is more important than finding the solution is finding the right problem and answer, uh, asking the, the right questions. So this uh, pressure amplifier, amplifier became much smaller, and then it can be integrated in the system. And here is uh, an example of uh, the early development of this robot performing force control uh, with capabilities uh, even superior to the Puma and with uh, reflected inertias that are so small that, uh, I mean, if we compare it to the Puma, I believe the Puma varies between 25 to 35 kilograms reflected inertia, and here we have 1.2 kilograms.
kilograms. Now, in terms of the, the control of this macro-mini actuation, uh, we are going to need to, to deal with uh, multiple issues. First of all, if we use pneumatic alone, the bandwidth of a pneumatic system is typically around 0.5 hertz. Now, sensing is very important. Torque control is very important, and in the case of pneumatic, what we did, we added uh, a, a strain gauge to measure the tension on the cable. Closing the loop take, took that uh, bandwidth much higher to about uh, 7 uh, hertz, and if we now integrate the small motor, we are going to be able to go much higher. So it's very important to think about feedback and uh, the use of the sensors at the right uh, uh, places in the design so that, in fact, we can uh, produce performance uh, that are much, much better. We need to use the models, but pneumatic are uh, very complex nonlinear systems, and unless we are able to, to to really sense the actual force exerted on, on the structure, it will be very, very difficult. Here is a, uh, an illustration of uh, the comparison between the effective masses for the different systems, and you can see uh, the magnitude of those uh, for a Puma compared to those to the human and to uh, the, those hybrid uh, uh, actuated uh, robots. Now, as we start uh, integrating these co components, you have a lot of wires, a lot of uh, component uh, to connect uh, all together, and we started to uh, explore the use of uh, shape deposition manufacturing uh, to integrate all of these, so essentially you are building uh, a sort of uh, a bone uh, together with the muscles, and inside you are integrating all the components in a way that is uh, effective and that is uh, going to remove all this cabling. Uh, these are some of the components in the design. And when you put them all together, essentially in a small volume, you are going to be able uh, to build uh, uh, an integrated system with all the sensing capabilities and connections and uh, uh, control abilities. In addition, we are adding skin to the system so that we will be able not only to uh, uh, reduce the first impact, but also to sense uh, the proximity as well as the contact locations. Well, I'm not going to go uh, any further in this discussion. Uh, just wanted to mention that we currently are building uh, the full upper body system uh, with the design of the shoulder, which is a quite complex uh, shoulder design and uh, integration, uh, all together with the same uh, technology of using uh, hybrid actuation, pneumatic, together with uh, electrical small motors. So I'm going to move to uh, the discussion about uh, uh, the control that evolved from how we control a robot with uh, uh, the ability of uh, torque control to improve its performance and in interactivity with the environment, and then how can we move to mobile manipulation. Uh, this started actually in the uh, early 90s. We uh, we built uh, Romeo and Juliet, and let me show you uh, a few uh, uh, segments uh, about uh, that work. So at the time, we didn't have uh, projectors, and we used uh, slides, and uh, I'm not sure any one of you remember that. So the idea that was that we wanted to take uh, manipulator, uh, the Puma, and uh, make it interact with the environment, so we need mobility. The question was not to move, stop, manipulate. The question was, how can we put the manipulation mobility together? You're holding an object, and you have an obstacle, you're moving an obstacle you, you want to move. How can you perform that? So there was this concept of task and posture decomposition. So the task is essentially the J transpose F related to the task, and the posture is everything you're doing in the null space of that Jacobian. Now, this is dynamically decoupled, and once you have this behavior, you're going to be able to perform all kind of uh, more complex behavior very simply by uh, saying, for instance, the posture is simply maintaining a distance from the hand to the center of the mobile platform. And the fact that you are using a heavy platform with a lighter 
robot relatively, you are going to be able to use this dexterous manipulation ability of the system, macro mini structure, and that allows you to perform much better in terms of the force uh, contact control and uh, the contact uh, uh, interaction when you are putting these systems together to manipulate uh, object. In here, you are also controlling the internal forces. Without controlling the internal forces, you will break the contact at the grasping point. So you see compliance here. Uh, you see uh, how the robot is able to touch a surface while moving and doing uh, 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 continuous control of the forces as the robot is evolving in space. So. Another aspect of this is the interaction with the human, and in here the human guided motion uh, is uh, allowing some degrees of freedom uh, of the task to be performed while the rest is coordinated by the controller itself. This is a very challenging task to put two robots, two platforms, uh, rigid heavy platforms to, 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 to perform a task like this where the human is guiding uh, both of them uh, toward a goal and uh, in fact compliance and force control and the ability to, to, to build that feedback is uh, critical. Yeah, we managed even to, to get the robot to dance. Who wants to dance with a robot? Well, what is interesting here is that compliance is achieved without uh, uh, even the, the, the full feedback. It is um, applied at, at different locations on the robot to allow that, that kind of interaction. So this concept uh, was, was really uh, uh, interesting and the implementation was spectacular at the time. But the, the challenge came in 1999, 97 to us when uh, uh, Honda uh, gave us the cha challenge of taking this, uh, I deal, those ideas and implement them, implementing them on a humanoid robotic system. Now, Doing that is, is quite challenging because uh, we are going beyond just the open chain ser series structure to a branching structure where you move the right hand and the left hand will be uh, affected. And if you put multiple of them immediately, you have a huge number of complexity bringing all these degrees of freedom to control tasks at multiple points, to control, uh, in fact, not only the task, but to remember that you have a lot of constraints that you need to deal with and at the same time you still have more degrees of freedom to deal with the posture of this of the system in a way we, you want to be able to control the posture without uh, interfering with the task and you need everything to be consistent with your constraints so that means we, we really needed to think about a whole body controller, not a controller to walk, controller to manipulate, but how the whole system is going to be integrated. And this is the whole body control uh, approach to the problem of uh, building motion, posture, co contact, uh, skills, all together in a uh, coherent fashion. So here is the task and posture decomposition we saw before. And uh, I'm going to take a few minutes just to go on some uh, ideas uh, about how, how this is done. And I'm going to start with uh, not the full row, but just let's take one arm and think about how we are doing this control. So essentially, this, the concept is very simple. It is the same concept that we, uh, we, we, we talk about when we're talking about uh, impedance. Essentially, you're going to a goal. You take a goal position controller. You create a, a sort of attraction to the goal through uh, some gradient of some potential energy. And Obviously, this gradient uh, could be applied to the robot simply by finding the, the, the torques needed at the joints, and this is Jacobian transpose F. Now, when we do this, what we forget is that there are accelerations uh, that are going not to be aligned with the forces because this is a multi-body system. F for a single mass, you will be moving along the same uh, direction of the force. So, in fact, if you want to move in this direction, your force has to be adjusted so to account for those direction and inertial coupling. Now, the inertial coupling means we need to establish a relationship between accelerations and forces. So this is the mass matrix in, in the task space, and which also uh, brings uh, the centrifugal Coriolis forces to the system. 
Now, once you have that, you can take an estimate of your model and correct your gradient. <laughs> so your gradient now is corrected with an estimate of your model, and you're going to be able to perform uh, a controller that accounts for those interactions. Now, when we go to the full system, a branching system, what we're going to have to do is to control the left arm, the right arm, the, the feet. You have a multiple number of points to control. And now, uh, the question is, where are you going to put those controls and how are you going to, to deal with those interactions? So, a very interesting way to think about it is just move back and, and look at all these points. All together, they could be viewed as one point in a higher dimensional space. And in that the higher dimensional space, you have a representation of your task. Once you have a representation, it's very simple. You find the Jacobian, and once you have a Jacobian uh, through the uh, models that we developed in task-oriented control, you can immediately find the uh, inertial forces. So you have the Jacobian, you have your uh, mass matrix, and now your mass matrix is describing something much more complex. That is, on the diagonal, what you are looking at you are looking at the dynamics associated with all these different points, and on the off diagonal, you have the coupling between them. So now you can see that it is the same model that we use for one point control uh, applied to multiple point controllers. The second big problem is well, you control this point, but you still have a lot of freedom of motion, you have the posture. And to control the posture, we need to understand the, the dynamics going on in the null space of your task. So if we take the full dynamic of the system, there is a portion of the dynamic associated with the task. And the relationship, this Jacobian transpose, is not simply a transformation between static forces. It also describes the transformation between inertial forces. So when we think about Jacobian, uh, we are thinking about that relation, that mapping projection to uh, producing the torque corresponding to the, tor uh, to, to the forces. Inversely, we are going to be able to find that inverse associated with the, the projection of torque in terms of uh, forces applied at a given point. And that involves a generalized inverse, and it turned out that that generalized inverse is unique. It is not a pseudo inverse, it's not, it is something that is related to the dynamic of that system. If you change the dynamic of the system, if you, you add masses to a different location, that inverse is going to change. That is going to create uh, something very important, uh, which we call the null space, uh, and we are null space of the torque decomposition, and this null space is not the uh, null space of displacement, it is the null space of control that is capturing the dynamics as well. So, to control posture, I do not want to specify all the positions of the joints to do that. What I would like to say, I would like to say my posture should uh, move the body to the mid-range of its joint position. Or I would like to move the body to, to maintain the, the center of mass and that other shoulder in those closer to those locations. So it's again a sort of uh, some potential, some criteria or some potential energy that is going to take your posture from one configuration to the other. Now this could be done very simply. Now we have a controller for the task, a J transpose, a controller for uh, the posture, the null space that takes control for the, the posture and projects them in the null space to guarantee that there is no interference. And the first controller we saw, this is the task controller. In here, simply we can create a gradient associated with the criteria. Now, what happens is if you do that, you end up with very weird behaviors. Because when you are projecting in the null space of the torque, you are deforming, uh, adding matrix associated with many other things that makes the motion very, very complex. In fact, you immediately uh, feel that your robot is moving to all the possible singularities. Now, what we have to do is to really understand the dynamics that is taking place in the posture space. 
And to do that, we need to understand what is that null space associated with, with the controls and associated with the motion that not, do not interfere with the task. So if we think about it, you have a description of your posture behavior. That description is some X, X posture. What you would like to do is to say, I would like to move and achieve that XP from displacement done in the null space. So that means in the displacement space, this is the N, N the null space of the displacement space. And from the, all the possible delta Qs, you are going to select displacement that are uh, uh, consistent with N delta Q. Well, if you look at it closely, that means you have a new Jacobian, which is this JP N, N associated with the task, that would guarantee that now everything you're doing in terms of displacement, and we, when you go to the, to the transpose, you will be consistent with the requirement of the task. Well, this concept, immediately, once you have a Jacobian, you have the model. And once you have the model, you have estimates. And once you have estimates, you have the control. And now your robot is going to move uh, essentially by decoupling and removing all these deformations. So once we have the structure, we have a structure that associated with the different uh, uh, postures, the different uh, uh, tasks, and this, con this controller is designed in the torque space, the decomposition is done in the torque space, that is the, the torque control, then you are going to be able to produce all the controllers and you are going to be able to achieve the decoupling. So here we see a task and we see the, the null space motion and the two are completely decoupled without uh, producing any acceleration as we are moving at the task points. So, Simply stated, essentially the whole body control is the idea that a task is controlled through some task potential field and the posture is controlled similarly and the two are dynamically decoupled. This is for a task and a posture. But this concept is going to now extend, as we will see very easily, to uh, adding the constraints, adding the contact and adding all the other requirements for the robot. Yeah, no trajectories. I, it, is, it is very interesting. Most of the time we look at robots as uh, if they were just a machine where we need to program all the joint trajectories to move. And this is something human do never use. Human move uh, to go positions uh, with all kinds of criteria. And the question is how can we learn from the human little more? And this was uh, a study that we pursued uh, together with uh, colleagues in biomechanics to, to understand not just to copy motion, but to understand what are those criteria, what are the characteristics of the motion, and how can we understand and capture those characteristics. So that means we needed to build models of the human motion, uh, building those models with the musculoskeletal systems. Uh, this was done with a group of uh, Scott Delp at Stanford. And uh, take the students to perform some tasks and try to analyze where the body is uh, uh, positioned when we are performing a given task. So the question is, if you, if you have a force, you're holding a weight, how do you position your body? You have all that freedom. Why human have those postures uh, that, that uh, take place when we are performing different tasks? And what we observe from the analysis is that actually as human move uh, in all of these tasks, we are essentially somehow balancing the effort exerted by the different muscles. We, when we move our body, we change the mechanical advantage, we change the transmission of muscles to forces, and we are always learning how to optimize that. So essentially, what we observe uh, uh, is that human, as they learn task, they, they actually 
make use of this mechanical advantage. Uh, in fact, it is the physiomechanical advantage. The mechanical advantage of the, of the limbs is the J transpose. But the way muscles are transmitted to the joint torques also is going to involve much more complex descriptions, and that brings this physiology uh, that is associated with uh, those uh, 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 mechanical advantages. So essentially, it is that in skilled tasks, in tasks that we learn, we are minimizing, so if we are making use of the mechanical advantage, we are maximizing the transmission from muscles to the forces needed for the task, which means we are minimizing the effort exerted by the muscles. Now, we can express this very simply. We can say, what is the, this criteria? What is this energy that we are minimizing? And you can think about it, think about one muscle. If you take uh, the tension of M of a muscle, one muscle, if you are minimizing the energy associated with that effort, it's going to be, that energy will be in M square. But you have big muscles and small muscles. We use distributed macro mini actuation. And in fact, when we uh, 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 analyze that energy, we need to account for the capacity of the muscle, the capacity C of the muscle. So essentially, the energy that we are minimizing uh, is going to be proportional to M square and also to C. And this energy is. Do you want to, to know the energy you minimize? Okay. <laughs> CM square for one muscle. But if we have all these muscles together, essentially this energy comes to be a quadratic form on the physiology, the mechanical structure that is the Jacobian and the capacity capacities of the muscle. So you can reproduce most of those natural human motion simply by walking down the, that gradient in the posture space. And in fact, if we walk through that gradient, we see why we drink coffee this way and not that way. This is the, the configuration where that energy takes a minimum. And in fact, as we increase the weight, that angle is going to change and goes up. In fact, we can observe this in many different uh, uh, tasks uh, associated with the whole body. I mean, think about it. If you are pushing something, you don't push it this way. You use your body to uh, maximize that transmission. So you are taking the most of the forces through the structure itself, and the muscles are uh, producing uh, less uh, effort. So now you combine balance, you combine uh, posture control, you combine uh, the task control, and you can, in fact, synthesize human motion, which now can be mapped to the robot, not through copying the trajectory, but rather through uh, uh, describing those criteria associated with the task. Well, this was implemented on ASHIMO, and in fact, you can see fluid motion of ASHIMO. Ashimo is not controlled to move to specific uh, joint positions. It is just moving the task and adjusting uh, the body itself. In fact, if I find my glasses, I can show you how this is working. 